we are going to talk about your sacred calling into a holy nation. Obviously, I'm referring to none other than the nation of Israel. If you're newer to this movement, you're in the process of just discovering your Hebrew roots, you're trying to get your arms wrapped around this, trying to understand it, then you're going to want to listen very, very closely today. And you're going to also want to listen very closely to the subsequent messages that are going to be coming in the following weeks. One of the great tragedies that has taken place for over the last 1900 years is the Christian church's perspective on Israel has become distorted, shall I say. The relevance that Israel has for their very own lives has all but been lost. And why has this happened? It's happened because heretical theologies have risen up to distort the truth. Satan is doing what he does best. He's coming in, sowing seeds of deception, sowing seeds of division. Let me give you a few examples of theologies that have impacted or influenced the church's perspective on Israel. The first is replacement theology. For those of you who are not familiar with replacement theology, that is the theology that states that, hey, God is done with the Jews. They didn't cut it. He cast them off. Therefore, we bring in the Christian church. The Christian church has now replaced Israel and is the new Israel. And while this is obviously a very heretical theology, one that could quickly be done away with by just reading the word, even at the Peshat level, you find that this is just simply not true, there is a far more disturbing theology out there, horrific and deceptive. I'm referring to dual covenant theology. It's a theology that states that, hey, the Jews have one covenant, oh, and the Christians have another covenant. Okay, and think about this. That's to say the Jews have one way of living, while the Christians, they have another way of living. I prefer to call this movement the separatist theology because I think it describes it far better because that is what is happening. Satan is getting in there and he is separating the Jew and the Gentile. And here's what's so perverse, so horrifying about this theology. On the surface, this theology appears to show a great love for Israel, a great compassion for the Jewish people. This is the theology that runs around waving the Israeli flag, saying, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They got the Israeli flag fixed tightly to their lapel with the little American flag. And while all these things may appear to be good, all the while, they keep silent in regard to the gospel of Yeshua. They will not bring Yeshua to the Jewish people. You know, one of the things that I've been told, one of the most anti-Semitic things a person can do is to keep Yeshua from the Jewish people. There's nothing more anti-Semitic. The worst of all of this, the worst of this theology is the Jewish people, some of them. Some of the Orthodox rabbis love to have it so. In fact, my own ears have actually physically heard a Jewish rabbi singing the praises of a very well-known pastor from this country, how much he appreciated all the support and love for him, and that he did not bring Jesus to him. One of the primary focuses of this ministry is about restoring the first century Jewish roots of the faith, because the faith is Jewish. Our Messiah is Jewish. The apostles were Jewish. Therefore, we as a community, we strive to emulate the first century church to restore that which has been lost, to purify that which has been defiled, teaching the things that the apostles taught, preaching the things that the apostles preached, observing the commandments that the apostles observed. I want to begin today by taking you to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And here we're going to find that Yeshua, he's conversing with a Samaritan woman. And a little backdrop here is the Samaritans were despised by Jews. They did not get along. Samaritans were considered half-breeds. And one thing that you should know is the Samaritans, they believed that the place to worship, to sacrifice, to worship the Most High, should be on Mount Gerizim. That was the mountain that when they were, went into the land of Israel, they were commanded to put the blessing on Mount Gerizim. And the Samaritans, who only believe in Torah, did you catch that? They only believe in Torah. They did not believe in the writings of the prophet, the rest of the Tanakh, 
They only observe Torah, said this is the place that we are to serve our God. Whereas when you get into the rest of the Tanakh, you get into the writings, you realize very quickly that it is Yerushalayim that is the place and the only place you're allowed to bring your sacrifices. It is abominable to sacrifice outside of the land of Jerusalem. So Yeshua's having a discourse with this woman, and I'm not going to get into everything that they were talking about, but at the end of this discourse... Yeshua sets her straight and listen to what he says. Verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, a lot of translations actually translate it a little bit more correctly. Salvation is from the Jews. It's that Greek preposition, ek. It means out from. So it's from the Jews. Think about that statement for a second. Salvation is from the Jews. This is a nation that was established to have salvation go forth. Israel was to be the light of the world. The Apostle Paul makes the following statement to his Jewish brethren in Rome. And a lot of people, when you, when you go to Romans chapter 2, they read it with a negative connotation. And that is not what Paul is doing here. This is, he's commending them for the good. And listen to what he says. Indeed, you are called a Jew. And rest on Torah. Make your boast in God. You know His will and approve the things that are excellent. Being instructed out of the law. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. A light to those who are in darkness. An instructor of foolish. A teacher of babes. Having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Here we see what their purpose was to be on in, in this world. To be an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. To be a light. Torah is a light. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, a light unto thy path. They were instructed in the law. Again, we find the Apostle Paul in Acts 13, 47, again speaking to his Jewish brethren. He says, for so the Lord has commanded us. Now Paul is referring to himself and Barnabas. See, the Jews at this time were rejecting the gospel of Yeshua. So Paul responds to them, The Lord has commanded us, and this is what he says, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. There is no nation in this entire world that compares to the nation of Israel. There's no nation more highly decorated, more exalted than her. She literally is the apple of God's eye. Listen to what Moses has to say about Israel. Deuteronomy 4, 7, For what great nation is there that has God so near to it, as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him, and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Truly, she is arrayed in beauty and splendor. Look at the beautiful intimacy that exists between Israel and the living God. For whatever reason, they can call upon him. The prophet Isaiah foretells the impact that this holy nation would have upon the world. And he says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth and will make with them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. What an awesome passage. Scripture states the world would recognize them, would acknowledge them, that they are truly blessed. Let me give you a real-life example of this. On February 16, 1808, John Adams, our second president, he wrote a letter to Vanderkamp concerning the nation of the Jews. And listen to what he says. I will insist the Hebrews have contributed more to civilized men than any other nation. If I was an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. They are the most glorious nation that has ever inhabited this earth. He goes on to say, listen to this. The Romans and their empire were but a bubble in comparison to the Jews. 
They have given religion to three quarters of the globe and have influenced the affairs of mankind more and more happily than any other nation, ancient or modern. Think about that. Rome, ask any historian scholar, they will tell you what's the greatest empire that has ever existed. And they will tell you Rome. And here John Adams comes on the scene. Ha, <laughs> pish posh. They're but a bubble. They're nothing compared to Israel, compared to the Jews. There never has been, nor is, nor will there ever be, a nation like her. So, it begs the question, how is Israel relevant to those who aren't Jewish? How does a believer in Jesus, who isn't Jewish, fit into this picture? Is there any connection whatsoever? The answer is yes, because it's to this holy nation to which you have been called. Let me explain. We find in Scripture that the Gentiles who confess Yeshua as the Messiah, they're literally like a wild olive tree. They're taken out, they're cut out, and they're transplanted into the natural olive tree, being one with the natural branches, partaking of the same root. That root is the root of David. Listen to how Paul explains this in Romans eleven sixteen. He says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now right off the bat, he, Paul does what he does best. He's building metaphor on top of metaphor to express a specific teaching. And in this case, he's referring to Yeshua. Yeshua is re- referred to as the first fruit. If the first fruit is holy, Yeshua is holy, the lump's also holy. If the root, again Yeshua, is holy, well, so are the branches. What's Yeshua say in John 15? I am the vine, you are the branches, right? We continue in verse 17. If some of the branches were broken off, speaking of Israel, natural Jews according to the flesh, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and, what's it say? With them, with them, become a partaker of the root, Yeshua, and the fatness of the olive tree. And then he gives a warning. Do not boast against the branches, But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. This is Paul's little pot shot, predetermined against replacement theology. Don't you dare boast against the natural branches. Now, when reading this passage, it's important that you understand that tree grafting, this was a common practice in the days of Paul, amongst the Greeks, amongst the Romans, whom he is writing to. So Paul uses this analogy to help those in Rome understand a spiritual A prophetic concept through the physical custom by which their own hands have handled. This would have really hit home with them. And so when they read Paul's letter, this analogy, this teaching, just naturally comes to life. Let me give you an illustration so that you can appreciate the picture Paul is trying to paint and what the Romans really understood. Here's what happens in tree grafting. First of all, you have to have two separate trees. You have the natural and you're going to have the foreign. And when you, when you graft a tree, you first must cut the branch from the natural tree. It must first be cut. And they always put a little notch in here. And then you go grab another branch from a foreign tree, and the notch is cut just so, so that when it is grafted in, you're left with one tree. It's beautiful. Once a wild olive branch is successfully grafted into the natural You shouldn't be able to tell the natural from that which was foreign because they're all one. Let me give you an example of this. This is a a pecan or pecan, however you want to say it, tomato, tomato. (laughs) This is literally a tree that has been grafted. It was grafted in here. And so this is two different trees. But when you look at it, you would never know. It looks as one tree. It has been successfully grafted into. When the wind blows... And it comes across, that tree moves as one. The branches go back and forth together. It grows because of the same root. They're a chad. My point is this. Nowhere will you find in Scripture two distinct, separate trees where the Jews are to serve Yeshua in one way, the Gentiles are to serve Yeshua in another way. It's just to the contrary. We are one tree. We move as one. We're supported and we're given life by the root of David. 
If you study the Tanakh, you find that it's filled with prophetic imagery of this grafting process where we see Gentiles, they're literally being cut out from their native habitat. They for, they're forsaking everything they've known or had known to become accustomed to, to literally come into the house of Israel. I want to give you an example of this. I'll give you a few. This first example is found in the book of Ruth. And let me just set the stage here. There was a man by the name of Elimelech, and he married a woman, Naomi. And Elimelech and Naomi, they had two children. They had two sons, Machlon and Kilion. Now, because of a famine, it had struck the land of Judea. They up and moved to the land of Moab. And while dwelling there, Machlon and Kilion, they take wives for themselves from the daughters of Moab. Okay? The name of the wives are Orpah and Ruth. Ruth marries Machlon, Orpah marries Kilion. Now, while dwelling in the land of Moab, Elimelech, he ends up dying. Naomi's husband dies. About ten years later, her sons die. It's just the women left in the house. She's left there with both her daughters-in-law. At which time, when this happens, it comes to Naomi's ears that, hey, the famine that was in the land has now gone. The Lord has visited his people by bringing bread to the land. So she decides that I'm going to go back to my homeland. And this is where we're going to pick it up in the story. Verse 8, we read, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, lifted, they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still husbands in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should say, uh, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. It's fascinating. I'm not going to get into it today, but what you will find is over and over and over in Scripture, two women are mentioned. One not so good, one good. You go to the story of Esther. You go to Revelation two women. Go to Proverbs, two women. Verse 15, and Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. What an amazing Imagery we have here of Gentiles literally being grafted in. Ruth forsaking everything she knew in her life. Everything that brought her comfort that she grew up in. Forsaking her own people. Forsaking her own gods. Why? To be joined to the holy nation of Israel. To the God of Israel. She literally became as one who was native born. She was cut out of a wild olive tree and she was planted into the house of Israel. And she is so much so of the house of Israel that you can trace Yeshua's lineage back to her. A Gentile who comes to faith in Yeshua as Lord, as Savior, their very transformation is to mirror that of Rus. This is how it should look. The people of Israel should be your people. The God of Israel should be your God. It's this very principle by which I named this congregation, Corner Fringe Ministries. I named it after a prophecy which states the Gentiles were forsake their ways to be joined to Israel. Zechariah 8.23, we read, Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man and say, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. You go to the Hebrew on this, where we see they grasp the sleeve. In the Hebrew, it's kanaf. 
It's the corner. Why is this significant? Because at the corner of a Jewish man's garments, you will find tzitzit. You will find tzitzit. It's very significant because the tzitzit represent something. They represent the commandments of God. So these men who are coming out from the nations, all the nations, they are grasping onto the tzitzit of a Jew, the commandments, they're clinging to them, and they're saying, let us go with you. We have heard God is with you. What an amazing statement. Go to Revelation. For the dragon was enraged with the woman, went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. It's powerful when you look at that. Amen? Also, think about this. Matthew 28, what was the Great Commission? Go out and make disciples of all nations, right? Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Are there two trees? Or is there one? There's one way of living righteously before Yeshua. The Apostle Paul explains it this way, explains this process and how it works. Ephesians 2.11 Therefore, remember that you once, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Understand something. You read the Bible. You read the Tanakh. There is Israel, and there is everyone else who is outside of Israel. This is a very simple equation. Israel, not Israel. And this is what Paul is bringing. You who were once uncircumcised, you were called uncircumcised by those who were circumcised. This is what he's saying. Then at that time, verse 17, you were without Messiah. Being aliens, pay attention to the terminology Paul is using here because he's drawing from Torah. You were being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Mashiach, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one, not two, one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. This is the glorious work that Yeshua has done. He has come and he has tore down that wall of separation. What does dual covenant theology do? It fights against exactly what Yeshua accomplished. Yeshua broke down the middle wall of separation, dual covenant theology comes in behind, and it has rebuilt the wall. What a tragedy. God forbid that the Gentiles who call upon the name of Yeshua should separate themselves from that holy nation as though they were called into some different tree or a different body. Paul goes on to say in verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. This is what Yeshua did by his flesh. He broke down the middle wall of separation. Abolishing the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create one new man. Now, what does Paul mean by abolishing in his flesh commandments contained in ordinances? Does that mean all the commandments are done away with? That's why he came? That's ridiculous because the New Testament reiterates the observance of Torah, reiterates the observance of commandments. Actually, when you read this and you read it as a whole, you look at this whole chapter, it's completely Paul sets up the context before he even makes this statement. Go back to that where that terminology was being used. Strangers, foreigners, aliens. Remember those terminologies? Those are the exact same terminologies you will find in Torah to divide, to identify those who are not Israel. And yet the very work that he had come to do to break down those law of commands contained ordinances that separated the Jews from the Gentiles. That's amazing when you look at that. Now we go on in verse 16. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body. Now it's interesting, Paul being a Jew, he's very careful here to use the plural, to reconcile them both. Who's he referring to? The Jew and the Gentile, right? 
together in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. He came and preached peace to you who are afar off and to those who are near. For through him, again the plural, we, Jew, Gentile, have access by one spirit to the Father. Verse 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. There's that terminology coming back. Why are we no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God? Because he broke down the middle wall of separation. Gentiles who confess Yeshua should not be moving away from Israel. They should be moving towards her, into her, grafted into her through faith in the Messiah, Yeshua. I want to share something with you that is pretty fascinating, at least I find it pretty fascinating. And it really gives some profound insight into the mind of Paul and how he really viewed the Gentiles who were coming into the faith and Messiah Yeshua and really just builds upon what we just covered. There's a prophecy found in the book of Hosea, right at the beginning, the very first chapter, and right off the bat, the Lord commands Hosea to do something very, very unusual. Go take a wife of harlotry. That's not normal. The reason the Lord did that, no, that does not give you license to do that. We're not to be unequally yoked. There was a specific purpose for that commandment. He was distraught with Israel. And he has this purpose. So he commands Hosea, go take a wife of harlotry. He does. Her name is Gomer, okay? And this wife of harlotry, she gives birth to three children. The first child she bore was a son. Now what's interesting, with each of the births of the children, there is a prophecy attached to each child. Now follow this. The first child's born is a son. His name is Jezreel. The prophecy attached, the Lord will bring an end to the house of Israel. She bears again. And you're to call her name lo Ruhumah, daughter. And it means, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel. And then she bears the third child, a son, and called his name Lo-Ami. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Not great prophecies to receive, huh? But at this point, he's given these prophecies. Right away in verse 10, we pick it up and we read this. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. He just got done prophesying to them, You will not be my people. Wait a second. You are going to be called my people. You are going to be called the sons of the living God. Now, my point I want to make here, this is a prophecy concerning Israel. Cannot be disputed. This is a prophecy explicitly about the children of Israel. Furthermore, we find Peter proclaiming this very prophecy to his Jewish brethren. In his first epistle, that epistle is written to his Jewish brethren. Listen to what he says. He says in verse 9, chapter 2, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. A couple things to mention here is number one, Peter saw the fulfillment of Hosea's prophecy with the coming of Yeshua. That is the fulfillment. Though we were cast off, now we are his people. Secondly is, again, who did he write this to? Jewish people, because it's written to Israel. Let me show you why I find this prophecy so fascinating. When we go to Romans chapter 9, we're given this insight into how the Apostle Paul views the Gentiles. Do you know that he quotes this prophecy of Israel? He quotes it to the Gentiles who confess Yeshua as Lord. Look at what he does, Romans 9.23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory, the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he had called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. 
As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who is not my beloved. And it should come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. This is amazing. Paul utilizes this passage to describe the Gentiles who are being grafted in. Again, a prophecy explicitly about Israel. Paul would never do such a thing unless he viewed them as his very own brethren. He would never take a prophecy that is given to Israel and apply it to the uncircumcised. He would never do that. And let me further say this. A Jew would never even call, meaning in Israel, he would never call a non-Jew a brother. Or in the Greek, Adolphus. He would never call him a brother, and yet what do we find Paul doing? 2 Corinthians chapter 2 of Titus, who is uncircumcised, he literally calls him his brother. That's an amazing, this is, this, is, this is an amazing revelation of how and what you are called to. You are not called to be separate. In Galatians 3.29, Paul says, and if you are Mashiach, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise. That's the power of our Lord. You start to appreciate this grafting in a little bit more when you see that. You read Torah, you're outside of Israel, you're outside of Israel. That's the end of the story. Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There are not two bodies, there is one body. There are not two trees, there is one. One of the most powerful prayers that have ever, ever been recorded is that prayer by Yeshua, that intercessory prayer. And we read in John 17, 14, I have given them, this is Yeshua praying to his Father, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. And this is referring to his disciples, Jewish men. I've not come to save uh, the, the righteous. I've come to save the lost uh, sheep of the house of Israel. He goes on, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Verse 16, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Then we come to verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for all those who believe in me through their word. Think about that for a second. Why do you believe? I will tell you why you believe. Because his disciples went out and proclaimed, according to Matthew 28, they, they abided by the commandment, go out and make disciples of all nations. Jewish men went out as a light unto the world, bearing the light, bearing Yeshua. That is why you believe. If you challenge that, pick up your Bible. Just look at the New Testament. Their testimony still speaks today. They are still preaching to us, Yeshua. And what does Yeshua pray for? Listen to what he prays for. You have, you have the ones that he's speaking who are his, and you've got others who are going to believe through their word. What is it he prays for? That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one, achad, in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Yeshua's heart, his desire, his own prayer was that the Jew and the Gentile would be one, one in him. John chapter 10, we read, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, the fold of Israel, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be Two flocks. No. I'm just keep making sure you're paying attention. One flock. One flock and one shepherd. Amen? Yes. Understanding this concept is crucial in exploring your Hebrew roots. The music team can come back up. 
next week, we're going to talk about what has happened. What has happened to the church? Why is the church not here today? Why are they meeting on Sunday instead of Saturday? Why are they celebrating festivals that I can't find in the Word of God? We're going to get into a little bit of the history of what has happened, and then furthermore, we're going to dig into the law, and this is going to bring us right into the epistle of Galatians. So with that said, Shabbat Shalom.